Hello, ENVS 410, summer intensive asynchronous mode. You are in the right place. So um, welcome. And um, this is a little unusual for a number of reasons, one of which is I usually co-teach this course. And I usually co-teach it with uh, my good colleague, Dan Nestle, and he and I are co-teaching actually uh, ENVS 110 this summer. Um, but he will be a guest lecture for uh, a few of our narrated PowerPoints. Anyway, what I wanted to do was go over the syllabus um, a little bit and uh, also um, Canvas before looking at this introductory uh, PowerPoint that I also want to uh, narrate. And so I'm going to share screen. And there's our PowerPoint. Uh, this is our canvas. And um, you can see I had a rather large announcement today. And uh, basically, it says kick back this week, uh, to a certain extent, read this book, it's beautiful prose, and then start putting your thoughts together in terms of this entry uh, assignment. Typically, this class is taught in the summer as an eight or nine day intensive, and students read the book and submit the short answer essays on Wes Jackson's book before the class begins. Um, so it's very intensive. And I say here, I think that uh, usually we're together six hours a day. And so um, uh, you can see that the workload is a little bit more evenly spaced now in this six week session, albeit in an asynchronous uh, mode. So um, uh, just doing a sound check here. Yeah. And so some of the modules are more intensive than others. You will know that by actually looking at the quizzes. Yeah, they're not really quizzes. The writing assignments, they're actually in quiz format because um, I think it's easier to give feedback in the quiz format. But anyway, if you look at the weekly assignments on the modules, um, for the modules, that'll give you a sense of how much writing you need to do for each of the five assignments. And as I mentioned here, one and four are denser modules, three and five a bit lighter, for example. Let's take a look at that. Then you have a personal resilience, which is just a diet analysis uh, assignment, and, uh, and then uh, a three-page uh, assignment on global resilience. And uh, that's it. Uh, you've got discussion posts, and that's just part of participation. Uh, related to the guest speakers, mostly, that you'll be exposed to in this class. Please think about extra credit if you want extra credit for this class and actually a module substitution. Um, you can consider working in the Western, so you have to be on campus, Western or nearby, uh, Arnson Gardens, and there's a lot on that and how that happens, and I won't take the time now, but just take a look at the extra credit modules, then contact me if you're interested. One student has already contacted me, so that's, that's great. We wanna get that going if anyone's interested. The guest lectures are for enrichment. They are super duper annoying because a lot of time is spent in, can you hear me? I don't know, where are the students? I don't know. We don't have bandwidth, oh really? Uh, sometimes that goes on for 10 minutes, and I've tried to alert you by saying start the video here, and then sometimes we're talking about course logistics for summer 2020. Super annoying. So um, again, I've tried to alert you, uh, obviously, uh, to where that is in the videos of the guest lectures. Try to skip over that uh, and or ignore it. Um, and then here's a note on working ahead, go for it, but I will not be grading and assessing work um, until within a week after the due date. And any late work, um, I will not be able to add comments to. So that is late work after the due date. Okay, that is our canvas. And hopefully we've been working, I've been working to make it as clear as possible. Let's take a look at our syllabus. 
in Canvas, occasional guest lecture, Dan Nestle, I mentioned, the format, the objectives, what are they? Actively integrate knowledge, communicate well, formulate thoughtful set questions. This is not a class on farming, it's a and on food so much as in terms of how to do it. It's a class on critiquing all the information that's out there on food. And uh, I mentioned that variety of literature and uh, kind of be confident in your ability to critique and communicate agriculture, agroecology ideas, but especially around resilience, which is a theme, a big theme in the course. Commitment to inclusion, our text, there's two, and uh, two texts. And, um, but we have a lot of other readings and uh, they should be readily available for you in Canvas. Canvas, check Canvas regularly for announcements. Um, plagiarism not allowed. Uh, and the grading is fairly straightforward. Just want to come to here. So you see that the reading video responses are pretty important. There's a total of five. And then discussion posts too. The introductory assignment I mentioned and then the two resilience assignments. Self-assessment is just an assessment of what you enjoyed most in the class, least and why. All right. And uh, yeah, and here's some explanations uh, for those assignments, but they're really fleshed out in modules uh, in Canvas. Okay, and I've got a course bibliography. And without further ado, I am going to go to our PowerPoint, which we will play from the start. Yes. Okay, agroecology. What is that? It's really about the ecology of food production, but also food consumption too. Here's my welcome note, disclaimer on those guest lectures. And uh, I think it's worth it. I think I, normally I would not include the guest lectures, but I think it just so adds to the, uh, to the class material, especially when we are in a synchronous mode. Okay, this was in the note I just read. And you can stop my narration, of course, and look at these um, slides if you want to look at them longer. Okay, class textbook is my book, Food Wise, and I donate the royalties from the book, which is a dollar um per book which of course i will never actually make any money off of this book that's not the purpose of it uh and uh see any of those dollars but uh but anyway um uh, i oh that's exciting uh, anyway, in the in the last slide, uh, besides the two textbooks, I give you a little overview of some of the other books that uh, I have produced kind of leading up to comprising, uh, building on my thoughts on agroecology. Okay, Wes Jackson's book is all about perennials. A no brainer for efficiency and bounty. Really? So that's the question you're answering, really? What do we mean by that? And so you'll see in the short answer essays for the first part of this little entry assignment, uh, I'm asking you to think about perennials and why they're so important to him, this kind of prairie food production is what he's looking at. But I should say too that the prairies are so important for, uh, and it, in, in many ways. And one of them is actually for 
could be, depending on the geography, pollinators. And that's one reason why I have one guest lecture this week, and it is Johannes Wirtz from the Gertianum. And Johannes Wirtz is our teacher when we take the global learning program version of this course to Switzerland and to Italy. And we study biodynamic agriculture. So that's one of the topics in our course. Um, and his specialty is bees. And without these flowering prairies, uh, flowering pastures, if you will, there are no bees. And it's one of the big problems in uh, bee decline today. So anyway, you can be thinking about Wes Jackson's uh, rant. Uh, on, uh, on industrial agriculture and oh, understand perhaps why he's thinking about prairie as a, as a source of food. Future of food. This is the second part of the entry assignment, looking at um, a little bit of the documentary. You're welcome to look at all of the documentary, Food Inc. It's disgusting. And, uh, and uh, certainly it paints a different picture than what you see here, which is a very integrated kind of agriculture, focus on soil building, on manure and green and composted inputs in order to provide an environment in which soil can form. And that is a fermentation process. Much of it is a fermentation process, aerobic and anaerobic, but so is the food we eat. And so eating fermented foods, whether it be meat uh, or dairy or vegetables or grains, should be, could be an important part of our diet. It's just a way to access more nutrients fermentation besides being a, a cool storage vehicle. And so in the third week of this course, I give you a guest lecture by Sandra Katz, our textbook author for my other class, the 110 class, and a good friend. And Sandor um, <laughs> is, uh, totally legit here on fermentation. He is a fervent, ferment revivalist and talks a lot about the nutrition behind fermented foods, but the same goes for soils too. But those soils need to ferment with a variety of, input, of inputs. Stan is our soils person. Um, and, uh, I mention that, uh, of course, I minored in soils for my PhD at Cornell and soils organizations paid for my work, but Dan is studying soils as his major uh, at University of Idaho, so you can't do better. And uh, I believe he's actually finished the narration on the soils presentations, the PowerPoints. We need to remineralize, re-enzymize, and rebacterialize our farms, foods, and bodies. This requires sound agricultural practices, fresh and local whole foods, and a diet that includes fermented foods. See what you think. You'll have a chance to reflect on this and get credit for it uh, as part of the personal resilience assignment in the class. But future of food production agriculture is part of it. This is Hans has five sons and probably 125 uh, dairy cattle. He is part of the Organic Valley Cooperative, very lucky to be in it. He's been in it for a long time. It's closed to, uh, to new members. And, um, and he has his Jersey uh, rich uh, milk. And he, so he's part of Organic Valley. He is organic certified. And we visited him once, but usually what I like to do on field trips, and that's what we, what we would have done in this class, in the spring version and the summer version, is go here to production agriculture, uh, non-organic operations. Although the dairy farmers say that they're really organic, just not organic certified because uh, of all the manure recycling and management they do to build up their soils. There's an argument to be made for that. So here is Troy Lenson's farm. And you have videos, uh, a video he made of his farm and a video of him with me 
in a Q&A from last summer, and that will be in module one. Look at Troy's operations, 700 milking cows, which is considered moderate. I mean, we're looking at 10,000 and 50,000 cow operations, 10,000 in Colorado, 50,000 in uh, parts of New Zealand or Australia, big. <laughs> Very different from 125 here. Idlewise Terry in Whatcom County. See what you think of Troy. You've got a discussion question on it. Compare it to Jessica Guijot. Dr. Jessica Guijot, faculty member at Fairhaven, although I think she just quit, and, uh, and to go full-time into farming, into her organic herbs and her, um, her sheep cheese uh, dairy and creamery and much smaller operation, 30 units being milked, so to speak, 30 sheep, not 700, not 125 is here. Or um, I think that for Ferndale Farmstead, they are actually milking much more than 700 uh, cows in Whatcom County. That's a young person in his 20s uh, who has started uh, an Italian uh, cheese creamery with their milk. Anyway, so many stories. Here, Lopez Island, uh, Scott Myers, good colleague, Kobe Beef, uh, Kobe Beef with a conscious, if, conscience, if you will, all part of our farm resilience study that Rebecca Pachi Green and our department and I uh, put together uh, with USDA funding to determine how it is that farms could be more resilient in Whatcom, San Juan, and Snohomish County, it, counties. It was a three county study. And Scott Myers happened to be part of that. Some of our results you'll be reading about uh, in this course. Indeed, what the world eats and how much that is demand is key to sustainability. So these, this image is taken from the Hungry Planet, which shows for a family unit how much food is consumed in a typical week. And you can compare this, of course, to uh, a family in Arizona, in the United States, in California, or a family in Kuwait or in Beijing, uh, what that's going to look like. Many more <laughs> foods, much more packaging, and a heck of a lot more processing. Let's look at the term a little bit. Um, agroecology and ecology combined gives us agroecology. So Carlo Petrini talks about this in terms of harmonizing the complexity of the food system. Uh, it's a mature science based on the idea that ecosystems can be self-regulating. But is it a science? Is it a movement? Is it a practice? And for whom? Uh, perhaps we can all agree that it is grounded in social, human, cultural, political, physical ecologies, right? Because there's so much to think about. But ecology really leads the way, helping us to understand agriculture, which is basically a transformation of the landscape, a manipulation of land, labor, and energy. And we certainly can invoke important concepts in ecology. Um, so uh, uh, agriculture uh, certainly involves the cycling of materials and what we find is that unfortunately pesticides as a material cycles uh, in the system, not through the system, but in the system and is sluggish in terms of breakdown or rapid in terms of deleterious byproducts. So it's problematic, agricultural chemicals. Um, uh, fertilizer is salt, and Henning Semsdorf will talk about this in his guest lecture, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, it, it has a very unique route for entry uh, into the ecosystem. Whereas the flow of energy is also an issue because it does flow out 
energy comes into the system, but there's really no way in which it can concentrate except in a little bit of plant tissue. And then it, and then it flows out according to the first and second, in particular, second uh, law of thermodynamics. And so a lot of energy is lost as waste heat to the environment. Ecological succession. So the landscape wants to look like this. The landscape doesn't want to look like this. Once you clear vegetation for the production of one crop or two crops, then you're going to have to add energy repeatedly in the form of chemicals, in the form of machinery to hold back succession, to hold back the weeds, so to speak. Um, and uh, certainly we can talk about limiting factors in agriculture. Industrial agriculture found that nitrogen was an important limiting factor uh, a little less than 100 years ago and started to use it uh, as a fertilizer to give plant production a big boost, which it did, even more than phosphorus and potassium, the other macronutrients in agriculture and calcium. Okay, and magnesium, okay, in lime. Um, stability, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of effort put into stable ecosystems because you wanna produce and keep on producing one or two crops. And then resilience, the ability to withstand threats is something which gets short change in production agriculture. We can certainly talk about agroecology in terms of energy and geography here, intensive cereal, land system. So a lot of labor goes into hewning, chopping, cutting back stone and bringing in organic matter for this rice production here. Another system is lowland, but intensive uh, too in terms of labor and in terms of the amount of land that's used where rice paddies are flooded. This is there's a variety of reasons for this, one of which is to control weeds, but it's an intensive kind of system versus extensive, extensive where there's a lot of land and relatively little labor. Intensive is a lot of labor and relatively little land. Extensive is the opposite. A lot of land, low labor. This is true in Nicaragua, an extensive system, I, uh, a grazing system, I took this picture. And this is the Frente Sandinista, this is the liberation uh, front of the Sandinistas. This was in the 1980s when they were um, getting established. But one of the things was to change this whole system, whereas you'd have crops being grown on the low, in the lowlands and cattle being grazed on the, in the highlands where it makes more sense, specific to uh, relatively low uh, cattle numbers. That was one of the promises of the revolution. Uh, slash and burn system. I took this picture in Jamaica, subsistence agriculture. Again, it's extensive because there's a lot of land involved and not much labor. You just burn the vegetation, release the nutrients into the and with the char and grow plants and then move on once the soil is exhausted. Low labor, a lot of land. This on the other side of what I just showed you literally geographically is the opposite. Intensive coffee production in Jamaica, steep hillsides. So a lot of land, land which is completely degraded and a lot of chemicals, a lot of inputs, um, a lot of labor, very intensive system. Kenya, back to subsistence agriculture. Um, and uh, this is a kind of slash and burn agriculture. This is a hippo, uh, hippo run right here, the Pacomo uh, indigenous uh, tribe uh, uh, in Kenya that uh, practices slash and burn agriculture. It rubs up against Kenya Wildlife Service policies and practices because this happens in uh, a primate reserve interesting questions there of resource use and conflict. So you can click on this and, uh, and you'll see the, a link to 2020 figures for petroleum use 
the United States is top of the pack in terms of industrial nations with petroleum. Here's an example right here of intensive water use and potato production. So agriculture itself is very energy intensive. The argument is it, it, is it accounts, accounts for an efficient agriculture. Um, and uh, this is in Switzerland where there's very little export agriculture and land devoted to agriculture other than pasture. Um, but look what's happened uh, since the 1930s. Our input puts imports, agricultural imports have increased, but so have uh, our exports. And most of that is to uh, our exports to high income countries, that is meat, grains, uh, and uh, relatively little to low income countries. And certainly a very low percentage of that is as food aids. So you can click on this for a little bit more information, but the United States import export uh, picture uh, is driven by agricultural exports. And so a lot of our agriculture, production agriculture is for the production uh, of exports. And that affects our balance of payments and makes Toyotas we import, although a lot of them are produced here, I get that. But anyway, vodka we import, I don't know, caviar, not that we're drinking or eating that, but anyway, imports less expensive. So that's what production agriculture gives us. Sustainability. We talk a lot about sustainability, Wes Jackson does. If you talk about sustainable, something as being sustainable or not, then what you need to do is talk about how you're gonna measure sustainability. And so these are indicators of sustainability and, um, and is the ecosystem a native ecosystem? Is there landscape connectivity for habitat, for mobile species? habitat for other native species, carbon emission reduction, sequestration, water quality, flood management, beauty and recreation, pollinator protection. These are typical indicators for sustainability. Is a system sustainable or, excuse me, not? However, I could argue that some of these dairy farms in Whatcom County, I mean, one in particular has in particular has a 40 acre wildlife refuge, which is funded in part with government funds. But anyway, do uh, follow, do um, I don't know, complete these criteria, but they might be milking 700 cows or 2000 cows, cow dairy. So, Dairies. So we want to like play with this idea of scale, don't we? The scale of operation and sustainability and how large can we go and still be sustainable. We need to consider the way in which we manage dairy nutrients. This is Troy, well, this is Troy Lenson's farm. Uh, this is a dairy that went out of business about three years ago, but uh, this is an earthen Lagoon, and Troy talks about this in the videos that you're going to see uh, in the next module. And uh, it's it was lined, and what he really wants to do is build an above ground. He has an above ground unit and another above ground unit. He doesn't have to. There is nothing illegal about this, although it, if he's controlling the nutrient uh, leakage, but it's more environmental friend, environmentally friendly to have the upground structure. He also is part of a program, a conservation district program that monitors leakage of nutrients, his nutrients from manure in the groundwater. This discussion happens at about 50 minutes in the larger Q&A with Troy, and it's a little bit difficult to follow, but if you can follow it, you can find out what he's doing in working with the conservation district to monitor uh, nutrient flow to protect streams. Important to keep the sustainability conversation going with farmers. This is Bellwood Acres. They have recently sold 
uh, but it still exists. And, uh, and they were part of our resilience, uh, resilient study. Here's farmers at the one dairy that went out of business about farmers, students that went out of business about three years ago. Bellwood Acres. So one thing agriculture does is it preserves open space, not a parking lot. Please remember that. So it's not houses. It's not McMansions. It's not privately fenced yards or cement uh, driveways. It's open space. So if we can work with farmers for sustainability and even better resilience, then uh, the ecosystem is going to be even better off. And work with them in terms of biodiversity too, something we'll consider uh, in module two. So I've been talking about sustainability, but really a lot of my work is focused on resilience, a resilient agriculture that identifies vulnerabilities and threats there's a progression, sustainable to resilience, the resilient, the ability to withstand threats, to regenerative. I have that right here, sustainable to resilient to regenerative. Ecologically sound, regenerative in terms of recreating resources. This is actually a picture from Henning Semsdorf's farm. All about experience too, agroecology, because it's experience that gives us practical wisdom, which is so important, critical to gaining wisdom. Secondhand experience is good, but practical experience is the best. Something we're not getting this summer, although we're doing our best with the quasi secondhand experience in our guest uh, lectures. All right. This is uh, some of the land use planning we participated in in various versions of, of 410. And then of course, uh, a visit to a premier biodynamic operation. And you're going to hear more about this in two modules from now, in module number two. Um, and typically we spend a weekend on Lopez Island in the spring where we visit uh, Sweetgrass Farm, Scott, Myers Kobe Beef, and then also the biodynamic operation of Henning Semsdorf, who's now in his 80s. And this is spring quarter. It is not without his challenges. He's a very challenging person to deal with. But I happen to believe that the goods are worth it, and the goods are what you're going to get, as well as a huge dose of what may appear like a religion, but is really spirituality. Uh, as he talks about biodyna biodynamic farming. So good luck with that. You'll have a chance to react uh, in the discussion uh, threads. And his farm is all about regenerative systems and uh, leveraged by outside, small outside grants. And he'll talk about that more in module two with a focus on biodiversity. More module two in his guest lecture. This is his pond, a uh, holding pond. And from here, he pumps up using solar electricity, uh, solar generated electricity, uh, the water to his upper fields where the gardens are. And we also get a very healthy dose of fermented foods when we are visiting uh, with him, as you can see here. All these foods were fermented except the lettuce, especially, especially the fresh, fresh vegetables, the sauce for the potatoes, the bread itself, they grew the grain, the butter certainly fermented, uh, and also sauce for the eggs and certainly the meat. So all fermented products. This gives us a chance to talk about fermentation. And uh, Mother Noella, the cheese nun, um, I don't think uh, you're going to see her guest lecture. Uh, I think I decided in my imminent 
uh, wisdom to uh, do something else instead. But the other class 110 is listening to her uh, as she talks about the mysterious world of cheese, the wonderful world of uh, fermentation. My farming background is ostensibly gardening and horticulture, but also shepherding. And then typically this class in the nine days or eight days comes here for three days uh, and uh, participates in um, milking and cheese making. And although I do have another class, cheese making class, uh, EMBS 314 taught with Ruth Sofield, Esai 314, which we canceled this summer. Um, so I could focus on my cheese and also I could focus on this class in 110, uh, two important classes to me. But anyway, we come to Shaw uh, and this little one we are milking now. Her name is Miel. And this little one is a weather bandit, her twin brother, and he is still alive and thriving at the monastery, which is also one of the places we visit and do some work at um, in the summer, uh, Our Lady of the Rock. And that she's done is actually the mother prior. She's moved from Connecticut to, uh, to bring her knowledge to this tiny little uh, island. However, these, la these lambs were born uh, in Sumas, Washington, which is where they go for breeding and birthing. was not atypical to have four little ones that we would have to bottle feed. Here's Bandit, the mighty Bandit, who is now a patriarch at uh, the monastery. And uh, anyway, some of the animals. Uh, Summer is on shot. You can see some of them. And I love this idea of everyone working uh, on these assignments uh, together in my house, like, you know, drinking tea. And that's what happens. Here's a visit to uh, um, to the monastery, the first certified raw milk dairy in the state of Washington. Oh, other food classes. 110, if you want to get more into food, the consumption of food, uh, and um, uh, that is still open, is being taught asynchronously. And here's our class, and here's Dan, baby Dan. Uh, probably about 12 years ago. And, um, and then I teach global learning programs, oftentimes with Dan. And please take anything that Kate Darby teaches or Terry Kempton. If you're not graduating this quarter, you might be graduating this quarter, in which case, I don't know. There's global learning programs that Dan and I do, in particular Switzerland, uh, Italy, and now Mexico in rural villages. Um, and I've had students take these classes who have graduated. I actually have two students already enrolled for 2022 and kind of post back graduation matriculation. Oh my gosh. Okay, and you can click on this link if you want more information or just wanna see more pictures or a really cool video that my students did. Oh my gosh, it's about three and a half minutes long. Don't worry, I'm not gonna show it here. And in the 110 class, uh, which is asynchronous, but uh, they're taking a cooking class, a one hour cooking class from this guy right here. They've got, uh, we've got the one hour cooking class and they're making eggplant appetizers and pasta. Um, here are places we go to in Italy to learn about agroecology and uh, ecogastronomy. This happens to be Volterra. Uh, and uh, this is a panacotta kind of, um, baked cream. Switzerland is a big part of it. And so I'm hoping to give you a dose of this this summer by this beautiful guest lecture with Johannes Wirtz. Please listen to that. That's this week during the entry module. What? During the, uh, okay, I'm going to go back uh, during the entry module. And also S S Henning mentions Johannes and that guest lecture when you hear Henning speak in, uh, in module two. And this is our classroom uh, when we are in Switzerland, but you get to have it in your own space uh, as you click on the guest lecture for this week uh, by Johannes Wirtz. He is, Wirtz, he is um, the name in biodynamic beekeeping. Dan.
Uh, Dan and I co-teach and uh, these classes and uh, and every summer we actually co-teach Fort Tan. Um, so, but we're bringing him on as a very special guest lecture. Huh, I love this. Uh, anyway, uh, one of the things that we do that's super interesting is go to the University of Florence uh, in the summer when we have the global learning program version of this class. And I thought about adding one of those guest lectures, but they're a little bit difficult to understand. But the practical aspect of agroecology and ecogastronomy is so important and up front and center during these programs. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Uh, 53 minutes, maybe my narration. So you may go through this at your leisure. There were a few links. This, by the way, is from one of my is when we do a weekend in cheese at my at my home on Shaw in the summer, but I don't do this anymore. That cheese class is completely online because it is too labor intensive on my part. That's why this 410 class in the summer is super special because I no longer make cheese with students except often persuaded when we do our weekend here in August. So um, I would just say, keep your eyes open for that remote uh, online version of the cheese class if you're interested, which you can take actually as a post back to, and the students even have made beautiful uh, microbial rind, rind cheeses uh, by using their refrigerator. Oh my gosh, things that you wouldn't think would be possible. Okay, everyone, I'm going to end this recording and contact me if you've got questions. Here we go on this wild asynchronous ride. <laughs>